So welcome everybody to tonight's CPAC meeting. We're so excited to have all of you tonight. Um, we're very excited. We have here today a very special guest, uh, Attorney Paige Tobin. So Attorney Tobin is uh, a specialist in education and special education law, and she works with our district, and she's been very gracious to come out tonight and offer us a full presentation on basic rights for parents. So, um, you know, Paige is going to tell us a little bit about herself, and she's going to go through some laws and regulations, and you can feel free, it's interactive, to ask some questions, and um, we're very happy to have her here. So thank you so much, Paige, for being Thanks. here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And as Karen said, my name is Paige Tobin, and um, I work at the law firm Murphy Lane Marie Murphy, and our, our firm specializes in representing towns and school districts, and I'm in charge of the student services um, department in our firm, and have been practicing law for now 28 years. Um, and all of my clients are schools and school districts. And I have, we work with approximately 50 school districts in Massachusetts, some large urban ones and a lot of suburban ones like Hopkinton. Um, and oftentimes, I know that the Federation of Children for Special Needs, which is a really amazing resource, and I work with them very closely on a number of issues, um, we'll, have, we'll have attorneys or resources who come in and do these presentations. And then, so, so some, I know districts um, like Hopkinton, sometimes it's nice to have them come in one year, me come in one year, you can kind of compare. I think if you look at our PowerPoints, they're gonna be identical. Um, as, but I, it is important to kind of go through, it's, well, both the law, and I, I find that in my years of doing this, it's, it's a really strange process because it is a process that, um, and a law that contemplates and works best when parents and school districts work together and each have responsibilities um, under the statute and the laws. But it's often unfair in the way of parents because schools come in with a lot of experience. Administrators go to school law courses and special ed courses and they come in with all this wealth of experience and expertise in the area of this complicated law. And parents are often, often coming in just as parents, as moms and dads. So it's extremely important for parents to really understand what their rights are. And I think always that one of the primary roles of the school and the teachers that you work with and the administrators, particularly in special education, are helping you figure out what your rights are and figure out what the laws are. Because when you are informed, then you're able to really participate and that is always the best outcome for the student. So I'm hoping that this presentation, which is gonna, is like a lot of law, so it's, I don't know, you know, on a Wednesday night how exciting it is, it's probably not very exciting, but at least um, it'll introduce you to the law if you're not that familiar with it and reintroduce you if you are. And then I believe it's going to be available for everyone because I'm not gonna, you know, you're not gonna memorize all the statutes and then you can go back and look at them. Um, so essentially, there really are two, the federal laws that have to do with children with disabilities is the IDEA. And that is an entitlement statute. So that statute says that students with qualifying disabilities are entitled to a lot of services from public schools. Then we also have section 504. So you might hear that students, there are some students who are on IEPs, which is an individual education plan, and some students that are on 504 plans. So it is actually really interesting to see the difference. IDEA, as I said, is an entitlement statute. You're entitled to certain rights, like Medicaid or Medicare. You're entitled to rights if you qualify. 504 is actually an anti-discrimination statute. So what that statute says is that students with certain disabilities are entitled to accommodations and supports that will allow them to access a general school general public school atmosphere to the same degree as non-disabled students. So oftentimes, um, while your child in Massachusetts is most likely to be on one or the other, an IEP or a 504 plan, 504, if, you, or if your child is a child with special education, is also very important to you because that is the statute under federal law that says that your child with a disability cannot be discriminated against in a public school. So that also is important. Um, Title II is the Americans with Disability Act, and then FERPA is the statute that deals with student records, and there's a Massachusetts statute that deals with that as well. 
and IDEA has this part called Part C, which is really having to do with early intervention for students prior to turning age three when they become eligible. So those are the federal laws. Um, and then the state also has laws, and Massachusetts was really one of the first states to develop laws that would be consistent with federal law, and that is Chapter 71B. If you um, have been around for a long time, people call it Chapter 766, but that's, it, it's actually Chapter 71B. And um, Chapter 688, which is 71B, B12, talks about transition services. And the transition services, if you ever hear that term, really is referring to the services that public schools should be providing to your student, to your child, as they are beginning to turn 22 and moving from um, school-based services to adult services. Um, then there is the Massachusetts Education Reform Act of 1993, and that act is not quite as important for special ed, but it really talks about what roles the principal has and the superintendent and the school committee. Um, and then there are all the statutes that the state agencies are involved in. So that is kind of the, the law, um, and that's all here, so you can, you can sort of see those. And um, in terms of sources, I do, actually I will, I will mention sources. So these are all things that you can Google, like Google's a great thing, um, and you can Google all these things and read about them. But, um, and if you do have a chance ever, and if you look at both um, Massachusetts, it's www.mass.gov backslash DOE, is where the state um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has a lot of guidance. So they have technical guidance on special education laws and student discipline laws and those sorts of things. And they also have phone numbers for people that you can call. So that's, all, that's a really good resource for families to use. And also the Federal Department of Education, their website is also very good. Um, so those are, those are resources that you can use online. And then there are rulings by the Office for Civil Rights and our, our state um, also has advisories and guidance. But again, those are all really great and available online. Um, I also wanted to mention that in terms of procedural rights, one of the things that happens if you're a special education student is at least once a year you're given a document called Notice of Procedural Rights. And that document, how is that given, Karen? Is that provided in, by hand? Yes, so we, we provide it in various formats, but primarily we provide it um, either after an IEP meeting, you'll get it with the N1, or depending on the nature of the meeting, we might hand it right down there to you in the meeting if you have questions, concerns about the process or okay. your, your rights. Okay, yes, so that document's called Notice of Procedural Rights, and that actually is a really great resource that sort of sets out in a very clear way what your rights are and also gives you resources about who you can call at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education if you have concerns or if you're, you know, thinking that things might not be going like the way that you want them to do and want them to and you want to kind of, you know, talk to the state, that's where you find that information. Um, and also again, Karen is always um, Dr. Zaleski is always happy to provide you with that information. Um, all right, so in terms of the relationship between federal and state law, any, kind, any state, and Hopkinton is one of the, you know, a public school district, they accept federal funds, and so they are obligated to comply with the IDEA. Um, and when you have cases involving state law and federal law, especially with the IDEA, the IDEA sets what is the floor. So those are the minimum rights and the minimum um, you know, things that must be required to all families. But states are allowed to give more rights than that, and oftentimes Massachusetts does. Massachusetts is absolutely one of those states that gives some rights that are way more than federal law requires them to. So if you are Googling and looking, and sometimes that does happen is, is like, you look at things that are kind of national or out of, out of you know, Massachusetts, and you think this is all I might be entitled to, you also want to make sure that you're looking at Massachusetts resources because you could have opportunities to have more rights than are available in, under federal law. Um, all right, so what are the rights? So certainly in regular education, and in the years that I've been doing this, this has just really um, been strengthened in many school districts, including Hopkinton, is that 
there, there is definitely this idea of universal design now. And it really, school is not like when we went to school and everyone kind of got the same thing. And if you couldn't hack it in a regular classroom, you might be pulled out or not even be allowed to be in that setting. There really is an obligation and there's a focus to provide a lot of individualized regular education supports to children in classrooms because the research really does demonstrate that students who are learning with their peers in a regular education setting often do better. So there is an obligation under our state's regulation and if you kind of look here, CMR stands for um, is the Massachusetts regulations and so if you ever wanted to read one you could google it and that's what that stands for but again it obligates all districts to have what is called a curriculum accommodation plan which is uh, which are resources that are available for all students and you do not have to have a qualifying disability so oftentimes that will be you know um, some re some reading services um, services for students who are English as a second language, any kind of remedial instruction, and that's often where school districts will start um, with a student to try to provide stu you know those sources of support to students in a regular education environment. Um, then there is what I talked about before, a 504 accommodations plan, and this again is a, is a plan that is going to allow a student with a disability um, you know, accommodations to access this educational environment to the same degree as a non-disabled student. And the requirements for this are that it's an individual with a disability um, who has a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits a major life activity. So it might be a student who has um, a severe peanut allergy and needs to have certain accommodations like a teacher wiping down you know, the snack table in between lunches or something. So those that would be an accommodation that would be on a 504 plan, maybe with an individual health plan. So those, again, that 504 plan is not a special education service, although special education supports can be provided in it, but um, that's what that is. And then in terms of special education process, who does, just in terms of the 504, who does so the, the, the guidance counselors. Sorry. So in our district, the guidance counselors at each building are responsible for the 504 plans. I am the 504 coordinator, although it's a general education um, service. I do oversee it because oftentimes when we are in the process of having a 504 meeting, it could quickly turn into a situation that warrants an IEP meeting. So it really does make good sense for me to uh, manage and monitor that. And I do work closely with the guidance team at the building level to make sure that all the students that are not on IEPs are receiving these accommodations okay. because it is their civil right. Okay, yes. So if you have a concern that your child might be eligible or you would possibly be eligible for accommodations under a 504 plan, you would probably you would go to your um, student's guidance counselor. Also, you should be able to go to a teacher um, or a building administrator and they would be able to steer you in the right direction. Um, in terms of special education process, the IDEA, which kind of, and our state law that sets out this process, is very, very regulated. So there's a very um, strict process that should be followed every time we're kind of addressing a student um, with disabilities who might be eligible for special education services. And that process basically comes down to this. I'm going to go through it, and then I'll just kind of go through it in more detail, and that'll, that, you know, that's kind of the presentation. So there's the referral process. There's an evaluation process, a team meeting, and a determination of eligibility, the development of the plan, and then the implementation of the plan. If there's a problem or parents are concerned that they are not, um, you know, the plan is not to their satisfaction or not what they think their child needs, then there are avenues in which they can um, seek redress through both the district and later on through the Bureau of Special Education Appeals or Courts. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Before the referral process, do we still do RTI? Yes, so RTI is called Response to Intervention. And that is part of the IDEA when it was reauthorized in 2004. So RTI is really, again, um, it, going back to what I was saying before, is that there really is an effort being made now in schools to make sure that all students are getting what they need and education is very individualized for all students and you don't necessarily need to be on an IEP to get individual attention. So RTI is a process 
where students are given different tiered levels of supports that are individualized, but it's not special education. And so sometimes that is a process that districts will use to see if the student responds to those interventions. And if they don't, or there's evidence of a disability, they might be referred. Yes. Okay, so referral for special needs. So really, anyone can refer for special needs. It could be you, it could be a parent or guardian. My suggestion, it does not need to be in writing, but I always think it's a good idea to send an email to ask because then it's very, very clear that you are referring for special education. Um, and, or it could be any person in a caregiving, you know, your doc, uh, the student's doctor, um, a teacher in the school building, a physician, psychologist, really anybody can make a referral for special needs evaluation. Um, one of the things that you'll see often in papers is you'll, you'll often see there's like a notice that, are, that are, will be in local papers that will say, you know, if you think your child might have a disability, you can always come into the Hopkinton Public Schools and ask for an evaluation and then we will evaluate. So this obligation of the district to evaluate once we receive a referral, it applies that, that there's a child find process. So that applies not only to the children who are actually attending school, but they're also to the children who live in Hopkinton that might not be in the public schools. So again, when should you refer a child? I, I think um, you should refer a child certainly when there's a disability that you suspect that might interfere with your ability to learn. And, and children can be referred as early as two and a half. And private school children can be referred. Um, and often, as I said, it's a good idea to make it in writing just because then you have evidence that you've done it. And as, because there is a clock that starts to tick. So as soon as you make this referral, the district has five school days to send you a consent to evaluate. And that has to be within five school days. Now, I, I, I've said that the school district can't refuse to evaluate. I know that Desi, because Desi um, called me because they're rewriting some guidance. So I, I was just speaking with one of the attorneys in their office, and they are gonna put something in one of their new um, guidance documents that talks about sometimes where you might not need to evaluate for a school district. But really, in Hopkinton, if you ask for a referral, um, you will receive an evaluation within, a uh, consent form within five days, and we will evaluate. Um, the consent form is something that, again, this is a form that the district is gonna give to you, the parent, that says, You've asked for an evaluation, and these are the assessments and the tests that we would like to perform on your child to see if they have a disability. So the assessments that are required are required by statute, and the consent form is, all of these forms also are available online, so if you wanted to, if, if this is a process that's new to you, you can go onto the DESI website that I mentioned before, and you can actually see all the forms. So all the districts use the same forms, they're state forms and there's not really variation. But we're required to do certain types of testing, and it's educational testing where we look at educational history, progress, um, grades, information from teachers, participation, communication, all kinds of peer relations. Um, we, we look at those things, and then we're supposed to assess in the area of suspected disability. So optional assessments, although if it's an initial evaluation, most often we would do a psychological and that would be things like IQ testing and things like that. Health assessments, sometimes a home assessment or any other, sometimes a speech and language and occupational therapy assessment, physical therapy. And again, it really is gonna depend upon what the suspected disability, but this is, when I talked at the beginning about this is like a heavy parental participation um, process, you as the parents should be speaking with the school and talking about the type of assessments that you think are important for your child to have. Um, and so that is it. And one of the things when we look at eligibility that's important, it's parentally provided information. So if this process is new to you, what you're gonna find is you're gonna get this consent form with a lot of assessments that you're being asked to agree to. And then as part of those assessments, you also might be asked to provide information. So they might ask you history about your child's medical history and how their developmental history, some family history, those types of things. And that information 
it, the purpose of getting that is making sure that the school has a complete picture about how your child is functioning not only at school but in the home environment and the community environment because if we know the most you know the more the school knows the more they can help plan for your child um, all right and then oh, um, So in, when you get this consent form and you get this list of assessments, um, you again, it, because it's a parent-driven process, you have the opportunity, you can say, hey, great, I like all these assessments, I agree to them all. You can say, mm, I don't think we need a speech and language evaluation because that's not a concern of mine, so I'm gonna say, no, I don't want that. Um, so you can ask, you can agree to them all, you can agree to some, you can say, well, I just had a neuropsychological exam last month for my child, so maybe the school district, would you agree to use that instead of making my child go through all this testing again? And um, again, the, the fact that you're agreeing to these services, that these assessments does not mean that you're agreeing that your child has a disability or is eligible, it just means that you're agreeing that we can assess your child. So it's not agreeing to anything happening with your child in school except for being tested. Um, so again, the timelines are really important and these are timelines that are on the school district and it's the school district's responsibility. Once we get the, the consent form, then the school district has 30 days, school working days, um, to complete the assessments. So non-school days don't count. So again, if it's like, you know, late May or June, if you're if you're get, if you are think, even thinking about doing a referral, you want to do it in enough time that it's like not going into the next school year because that just delays everything. So you need to think about that as well um, because they don't test over the summer. <coughs> um, and this is uh, not so important, but if you move during the, the the evaluation period, the new school district doesn't have that same obligation. They just have to do it as quickly as possible. Um, and I do mention also the time frame to evaluate, well, it's 30 school working days and that's a very strict timeline. If parents, you know, don't agree, like produce the child, so I did have a case last year where the parent signed a consent to evaluation and then took the child to Italy for two months and then was upset that there was no testing but the child was in Italy. So you actually, there is an obligation on the part of the parent to, you know, bring your child to school to be tested which um, I would think would be obvious, but yes, <laughs> you need to do that. Okay, um, so that, okay. So when do we do these evaluations? And again, the purpose of the evaluation is to gather as much as information as we can about your child so we can make the decisions with you about the services your child needs at school. So we do them for an initial referral. That's the first time we're trying to figure out is your child eligible for special ed services or not. Um, Massachusetts law says that we have to do it at least once every three years. So sometimes parents will say, uh, you know what, my child was tested once and three years has gone by and I don't really want them to be tested. And actually that is one of those areas where the state is, is pretty clear that it, the district does have an obligation to test every three years because things can change. So you do want to think about agreeing to assessments every three years or sooner if necessary. So if there is a huge change in circumstances, um, or if your child's not making good progress, it might be an opportunity for you and the school district to say, you know what, it's only been two years, but um, he's really struggling with these social things and, and maybe we should do some testing now. So you can do it earlier. Um, there are some tests that you really can't repeat after, you know, earlier than a year. Some of the psychological testing isn't valid if it's done too often but really every three years. Um, the IDA says at least once every three years unless you say the reevaluation is unnecessary and the IDA also limits it to once per year unless you agree. Um, if there's a medical issue, then you certainly would be doing, um, if you know the child is unable to attend school for more than 60 school days, then you would also be doing an evaluation sooner. And 
Yes. So after the three years, do they automatically do the reevaluation, or do they, or can you request it if they say, okay, we think this child doesn't need to be on an IEP anymore, then you can request it, or do they automatically do it? No. So, so actually, if you're going to remove a child from an IEP, that is one of those things I was going to talk about next. When you should do an evaluation. So really, you should be doing an evaluation prior to making a decision that a child shouldn't be on an IEP, and it might not be like the whole. Reevaluation that might not be all of those, um, but you want to gather information and look at testing. So really, so when you look at an IEP um, document, on the first page there's a date for when the reevaluation yeah. is. So my son's three years coming up. That's why I'm. Asking. Okay, so then you should be getting at some point. Um, you should be getting a consent form to do testing. Okay. Yes. So you. Evaluations are required for the initial referral, so you can't put someone that. Sometimes parents have that issue as well. I had that last week where a parent was saying somewhere, you know, I know my child has a disability. Um, the doctor said that my child has autism, so they need to be on an IEP right now. I don't want to wait for this 30 days for testing, put my child on an IEP. So we can, the school district can't do that. The school district has an obligation to evaluate. Um, and so before your child goes on an IEP. So again, they can sometimes take some testing that you have that you've gotten from the outside, but they have an obligation to do their own testing. So, um, and then we're gonna reevaluate before determining that a child is no longer eligible. That's, that's important. Um, if it's graduation, uh, you know, or if the child is turning 22, children don't get services beyond 22, so you might not have a full reevaluation then. You might be looking at summaries of, of um, work progress, and the same thing with graduation, and that would kind of depend upon the child that's individualized. Um, for Section 504, if your child is on a 504 plan, the law is actually silent about when reevaluations would occur. But the state has suggested that it's really good guidance to do it at least once every three years, or unless there's a big change for some reason. Okay, and so what are in-school assessments? So school assessments are required to be performed by individuals with appropriate training and credentials, i.e. people that know what they're doing. So if it's a speech and language evaluation, it's going to be a speech and language pathologist that does the assessment. Um, and they are, again, I bring this to your attention that it's very important because we are required as a school district to use a variety of tools and to consider information provided by the parent. So sometimes parents have all sorts of information that's really, really important and they're reluctant for some reason to come to a team and share it with the team. Um, and if that is so, and again, uh, there may be things you may not want to share, there may be things you're not sure are relevant, but you can always speak with the team chair or with Dr. Zaleski about what that is because it is important to get that information. Um, and when you, after that happens, you get this assessment and, and the assessment is going to really talk about what, it, what tests the, the, the evaluator used um, and any kind of educationally relevant material and it's going to recommend you know, talk about your child and their strengths and their challenges and talk about what your child might need. And that's what an assessment should contain. Should contain. Now, you have the right to receive copies of the assessment two days in advance of a team meeting. So if your team meeting's coming up, so sometimes, and it just depends on the year, at the beginning of the year, the district might be slammed with a thousand new re you know, requests um, for testing, but if your team meeting is coming up and you haven't received your assessments yet, you you know you want to reach out and send an email and say, please provide my testing two days prior to the meeting. So you should have that so you should, and an opportunity to review it. If English is not your first language, then you should receive all of these documents in the native language that is preferred for you. Um, and it, you uh, again, if you want the team to consider something at the meeting it's really important also that you try to provide it in advance. If you, there's, um, the law says that the team has 10 days to review any evaluation that you get and you want to provide to the team. So what you don't want to do is come to a team meeting with like a neuropsychological exam that you got yesterday and hand it to the team and say, please consider it. Because the, the district will have to say to you, you know, we're going to have to reschedule this for 10 days and come back. 
because they are they're experts, they're psycho psychologists, they're you know teachers, they're evaluators are going to need time to really sit and look at the materials you give them. So it is a good idea to give it give them prior. Um, and what happens at the team meeting? So again, if it's an initial team meeting, what we're doing is we're looking at whether your child is eligible for services. And if they are, the team works together to develop an IEP and what services your child will receive. Um, the, that initial team meeting should be within 45 school working days after receiving the consent. And again, um, that, that also is a very strict timeline on the district. So who, goes, who is on the team? I, I have parents first because again, in my view, the parents are the most important members of the team. Um, and if at least one regular education teacher, if the child is or may be in regular ed, if it's a student in a completely sub-separate setting and doesn't have a regular education teacher there, there would not be one at the meeting. It, what, what I would say about that is that you, you know, if, if your child is in high school and has five regular ed teachers, they're not all going to be at the meeting. So if it's important for you that one subject, like it's the math teacher that's there, you want, you know, and it's one regular ed teacher, you're going to get an invitation with the names on it. If you want someone else to be there, then you would want to call the team chair and tell them that. Um, at least one special ed teacher would be there, a school district representative with knowledge and authority. So there's an obligation that the school district provides someone to you at the team who has the authority to make decisions that are to, to you know, implement um, money decisions and educational decisions for your child. And any the people who are doing the evals that can talk about them. So those are all the people. Um, again, the parent can really bring um, anyone they want to, to a team meeting. I, it's a good idea to let the district know who's coming. Um, I, I just think it's polite and respectful to the district and the team to let them know and to, you know, that's important, but you, you can bring anyone you want to the team. If it's an attorney and you're bringing an attorney, you have to let the district know first because they won't attend a team meeting with an attorney um, unless, they're, unless their district council has an opportunity to attend. So that's kind of just a waste of everyone's time and money to show up with an attorney. But any attorney that you hire is gonna know that and they're not gonna come to a team meeting without letting us know. Like it's a small bar, we all work together. Um, and so that's important as well. Advocates are allowed to come without prior notice, but I do also think it's a really good idea. A lot of times in these communities, the advocates have worked in the district many times before and have relationships with people. So it's really, you know, it's good to say, oh, well, that's an advocate can be a really great resource for parents. To say there's, you know, oh, this advocate's coming, that's great. We know that we're all gonna be here and working together. So that's also um, good. And also the child. So the student um, is invited when he or she turns 14, and that's Massachusetts law. In federal law, it's 16. And, but students can come earlier, and sometimes students, parents have students come for part of the meeting and not the whole meeting, um, because it is important as they start to get older that they learn to self-advocate, that they are kind of recognizing their own disability, and they have a say in it. So uh, the student is a really important team member too. Um, there is something that you have a right that's an important right, and that is, so prior to the team meeting, you're gonna get a meeting invitation that lists all the people the district are inviting. If one of the people can't be there, the district should be letting you know prior to that and, may, and asking you to sign a waiver. So that happens sometimes. You know, the team meeting has been planned for three months, and then the math teacher is out with the flu that day and isn't gonna be there. So it would be the expectation that the school district is going to inform you and, and give you an opportunity to waive their presence. If the math teacher is super important to you and they're not there, then you know there would be a discussion about um, having part of the team and reconvening or what you're going to do. But that is a right that you have. Um, and let's notice. Um, all right, and we talked about the task of the team to, is to determine eligibility um, and then redetermine that every three years, review progress and develop the IEP. Um, and for in terms of what eligibility is, this eligibility is very simple. It's a student has a disability or disabilities, they're not making effective progress in school as a result of the disability, so not for another reason. And they require specially designed instruction and related services in order to make progress. 
So the existence of the disability, Massachusetts law has the um, different disabilities. And again, this is different than a 504. 504 doesn't limit to all of these categories. So 504 is much broader. But the 10 categories of disability are autism, developmental delay, intellectual impairment, um, sensory impairment, neurological, emotional, communication, physical, and health impairment, and specific learning disability. Um, so those are the disabilities. And one of those disabilities must be found in order to be eligible. Um, and then it's a failure to make progress, which has a very, very specific term. And, and that, again, that's why you're going to get a copy of this PowerPoint. I'm not going to read it all to you now. But th the first paragraph is really important, because that really is what is failure to make progress. It is, um, and it's, so it's good before a team meeting, I think. I, al I also like when teams talk about you know, what is this definition at the team meeting. It's, it's a failure to make documented growth in the acquisition of knowledge and skills, including social emotional development. So it's not all about grades. It's about the student's ability to, to make friends and at lunch and to talk to people and to be happy generally in the school within the general education program. And again, with or without accommodations. And this is um, also very important, which is it's according to their age, developmental expectation, and the individual educational potential of the child. And that is Massachusetts really saying to you that we are not looking at your child as a label. So if your child is a student with autism, we're not saying every student with autism requires the same services. We're saying in Massachusetts that we look at the individual educational potential of your child, not of a child with autism, but your child. And that is very, very important, and that is the focus of the team. Um, so we should always, at a team, be talking not about a program that we might have available, but talking really about what it is your child needs. Um, and again, I just my little plug to Hopkinton, they do that really well. Some of the sticks. That's a work in progress, but we do that well here. We're you know focusing on your child. Um, so the third eligibility requirement is that they need special education. So special education is specially designed instruction in order to help you make progress and related services. Um, now in Massachusetts, related services are services that are, are things like speech services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, counseling services. In some states, you, you can't, those aren't enough. If you need that alone, like if you, your child has an issue with speech articulation and just needs speech services, you're not eligible for an IEP. In Massachusetts, you can be. Those services also can be made available to you on a 504 plan, but it's not necessarily true that you would have other types of services in Massachusetts. Um, Paige, can I ask a clarifying question sure. back about the neuropsych being handed in by parents? not being obviously handed in right at the team meeting and being accepted, but if it's accepted the 10 days before, is that implied that the district will agree with the neuropsych testing and not do other testing within the district? No, no, so no, it, and it's gonna depend on the circumstances. So there was a slide way at the beginning that said that the district has, so the district under the law has a right and an obligation to do its own assessments. Sometimes if, so the district, should be doing some of its own assessments. Sometimes, again, if the, the parent has gotten an assessment and it's recent and the district looks at it and says, oh, this is by Dr. Blah, 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 who we all know is a great doctor and, write, and does good assessments and write good reports, so we don't have to do another speech and language because we know this person does a great job. We'll accept it and we won't do a second one. Is that, and that is gonna be an individualized decision. So that information that is sort of accepted that you'll take that part of the neuropsych, how is that told back to the parents without being at the IEP meeting so that you're not like well, thinking so, that your kids so having that service? The, the, the district test it, if you will. Is, yeah, sure. So the, so I so, so that's I'm, in the same timeline? Yeah, so <laughs> the, so the parent the district's gonna send you the consent to evaluate and it's gonna list all the assessments. So yeah. I guess if you if you send to the district your assessment and say, I have this assessment, um, can we please use it instead of having you do this, this testing? I would assume there would be some conversation. All right, we won't, we'll cross that off, just cross it off the consent because we agree that we don't have to evaluate in this area. Sometimes the district may 
you may provide an outside an assessment and the district may say, this is a really good piece of information that you've given us, but we still want to do our own testing. Yes, more. And, more right, less. and it's going to depend on the, upon the circumstances, but no matter what, whether we want to do our own or not, we have to consider yours. At the team, the team is obligated not to necessarily accept everything that's written in it, but we have an obligation to consider it, and that, and that is what will happen. And again, whether we do we also do some or not is going to depend upon the circumstances. So how does that work, whether or not the district does their own assessments? I, I have my own neuropsych, and we're at conflict. Is that when we're going to go to appeals, or is that like... No, it just is. How, who, how do you choose? Because the parents have gone and spent all this money from Dr. Blah, blah, that we all know and love. But then, Karen, over there is doing a test on my kid, too, and I'm like, yeah, but like, I know I love Dr. Blah, blah, blah and I, so, I think what he says is more appropriate. So what, what, this is what happens. So the district takes all the assessments, wherever they come from, parentally provided information, which would be, you know, the outside assessment, which is, again, as I said before, super important information. We take it all, and the team talks about and considers all of it. And so I, it is really rare that you're going to just take one thing and that's going to tell the whole story. So it's, it's information from a variety, and that's what IDA says, a variety of sources. You take all of that, and there's going to be pieces from this and pieces from that. You're going to consider all of it and then make decisions. And that's a team decision. So if you don't like what the team decides, even though you know, you're a part of it, you don't like what the team decides at the end, then there's opportunities, which I'm going to talk about um, that's to, right. to address it. But that, that's what should happen. All of it is considered. I know Karen's probably inside of my um, because I know the answer. <laughs> okay. No, I think it's a great question, especially for other folks. No, it, it's, it's a really it's a, good question. Really, because you do come, parents do come to the team oftentimes with a variety of outside assessments, whether it's a neuropsych, a speech assessment, whether it's a known provider or not a known provider. And there's lots of good information, even to the not known providers, that we definitely consider. But I think to Paige's point, and I appreciate the clarification tonight for families, is um, we look at all of the components, and we might we might like something that Dr. Blah Blah, blah says who we love <laughs> more than something that we found, and we might actually might go with that. So that's that's the flip side of it. We might do that as well, um, and it really is indi individualized. So it really just depends on everything that's been happening in the schools and all the tests, um, and then all the team input. But it's a yeah, good, it's a good there's, question. there's assessments, and then there's the information about how is your kid actually doing in functioning sure. in school. Yeah. So like you have to take all of that. Yeah. How's your kid doing homework at home? Like there's so much that goes into it. So it's not ever just looking at one little piece of paper and saying this is what we need to do. It's it's not what's contemplated, and it doesn't you know. So that's, that's what happens. Thank you. Um, can I just interrupt you before sure. you go any further? When you go back to the qualifications, um, ADD and ADHD is one of them. Is that is that true? Um, can the school That would be under other health impairments. So that would ADHD, be more ADHD and ADD are, are one of those um, interesting situations where sometimes those students could very well be served on a 504 and sometimes on an IEP, and that's a very individualized decision. But, but that's but that's more determined by like a pediatrician, correct? Like I would have to get a diagnosis from the pediatrician rather than the school for a diagnosis of ADD. Um, so again, so just in terms of eligibility, um, it's the eligibility. It's the developmental delay, right? No, I'm sorry. Oh, it's under health. it's under health impairment. There's a category called other health impairment that really again speaks to students who have a medical diagnosis of some type that is um, making it so they are not able to make effective progress at school and need specialized instruction. So it, so it would be that, generally speaking, school districts aren't providing medical diagnoses, but if, if your child had a medical diagnosis, right. then... So, but they can't say, oh, your child you know, would, would qualify for health impairment because we think they have ADD, right? That, that's not how it works. They, they, don't, they won't diagnose right. ADHD. Okay. Now, it, now, for a 504 plan, which is really interesting, so, so you need to have, for an IEP, one of these categories. Like, you need, you need one of right. these categories. For 504, you don't. It's a, if you look back at the slide, it's any physical or mental impairment. So there's an, actually no diagnosis needed for 504, which is interesting. That's just Can I just add a qualifying layer to your question? So it's, as a district, we don't, we don't diagnose ever, mm -hmm. right? Even outside of ADD. Right. So I just want everybody to know that. So we qualify. 
So we see symptomology that, for instance, in our early childhood population who may not be diagnosed yet, we may definitely see symptomology that right. someone is looking like they might have autism. We can absolutely qualify you and bring you in at age three as you're going through the process working with you know providers and then giving us additional information. Uh, we can come to a table in a student in the upper levels and see symptomology pertaining to ADD and qualify, start qualifying folks for service, but never ever do our practitioners diagnose. And there's a difference between a category of disability for eligibility and a diagnosis. Right. medical diagnosis. Yeah. So I, thought, I thought they couldn't That's say right. ADD, but I've had That's teachers right. I've had teachers before right. say that you know there's trouble concentrating, so we've given him other um, tools like bouncing on balls, whatever. So I was always wondering if I would have to go to the pediatrician for him to qualify for the health impairment or a 504, you know, whatever it be. Um, for a 504, you do not. For health, it has to be a health impairment for a health impairment, but you can individually talk with the right, guidance right, counselor right. Okay. about what evaluations we might be able to do and assessments to have your student qualify if for some reason you didn't want to go to a doctor. Mm -hmm. okay. and, I don't know the answer, but um, I just want to clarify for parents at home, money that's all behind an IEP, like you had mentioned, federally funded and state funded, is there money federally funded for the five or also? Um, well, it's a, it's accommodations. No, because it's an access. So it's not an entitlement statute, so it's different. <coughs> I talked about it before, yeah. Um, but again, you have a, I mean, a, I just wanted to clarify. Right, but the 504 is a really powerful tool for, for uh -huh. you know, I don't want to, the fact that it's not an entitlement statute doesn't mean that it's not a great resource for a student who needs sure. um, accommodation. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, and again, in terms of the specially designed instruction, it can be within the regular classroom, it can be pull out separate. Um, certain students require a private educational school, and there's a continuum of placements required. So the school district is obligated um, to try to educate your child in the least restrictive setting, which is a general education setting with general education peers. And if they cannot do that, then again, you go up the continuum um, to a private education, special education school outside of the district, or what's viewed as the most restrictive placement by the state is would be home home instruction. Um, okay, and related services I think I talked about. Um, parent counseling and training is a really good component of that. And, and again, there, there are services that are required to assist a child to benefit from special education. So if the child is found um, not eligible after an eligibility finding, then in, the district is gonna let you know um, in writing within 10 days. If they agree that you know the student has a disability but um, they don't qualify for an IEP, it may be the district is, says, you know, your child does not require specialized instruction, they don't, they don't um, meet the standard from the federal and state law for an IEP, but they may require accommodations to access school, and then we would make, perhaps suggest a 504 plan, and there's a whole process for that. Um, also, if they say that, you can submit additional information and always request a new evaluation in the future. Um, and then if a student who was eligible, but then there's a team meeting and, and the, the team says they're no longer eligible, they don't require specialized instruction anymore, um, then the student would have stay put rights if you disagree, then you, they can reject the finding of no eligibility and have a stay put. Um, and if they're eligible, the team develops the IEP. Um, and again, often it's usually at the same meeting, um, and, or you could have a separate placement meeting within 10 days. And sometimes there is something called an extended uh, evaluation option, which is where you do, and it tends to be more complex cases, you do an evaluation and you have enough information maybe to find eligibility, but you really can't, fit. you have, based upon the information that you have, you can't figure out exactly what the student needs in terms of an IEP. So you might, they might suggest that there be an ex a longer evaluation period in maybe a therapeutic setting or something where you can get more information. Um, I did want to note, and I'm not going to read this to you just because of the, the timeline and you can all read it for yourselves, but it'll be in the PowerPoint. If your student is a student who has autism, there is a state law that went into effect that really talks about things that the team has to consider. There's a whole list 
and those need to be considered. They don't necessarily apply. Again, it's very individualized, but these are things that have to be considered. Um, so the contents of the IEP is there's parent input, and again, that's a really specific place where parents are going to say exactly what they're concerned about, identifying the areas of need, um, how the child's disability affects progress, any type of specially designed instruction, um, performance levels, and again, really what people focus on are what are the goals, what are the benchmarks and objectives that the team agrees, the parents, the educators all say your student should make this amount of progress in a year and how are we going to get there, what are we going to do and what are we going to provide. Um, and again, this document, the form is online if you haven't seen it, it's a state form. Um, interestingly, the state's actually doing a whole bunch of pilots right now, some different forms to make it a little more uh, easy to kind of go through. It's <laughs> I've seen them from other states, and I think Massachusetts is actually fairly good compared to other states, but um, anyway, they'll, it's going to talk about transportation, whether your child requires specialized transportation as a related services. It's going to talk about anything your child needs to be able to take the MCAS um, and any transition services, which have to start happening when your child turns 14, and that they have to be related annually. Um, in terms of services, are we like super late on time? No, we're, okay. okay. We would love it now. So we have a few minutes. A few minutes. All right. So again, the standard for services, and you hear this often, is FAPE. So it's a free and appropriate public education. And what does that mean? So there was recently a Supreme Court case called Andrew F. that really talks about what a free and appropriate public education is, because some states that that was a case that came out of Colorado where Colorado was really saying that students needed a minimum, like a, a very low level of services in order to receive FAPE. Andrew F. Um, is really just about um, allowing students based upon their individual potential to make effective progress. And that is really consistent with what Massachusetts has always been. So where other states were kind of like, wow, this is a really big deal, this new Supreme Court case. In Massachusetts, it was business as usual. We have a very high level of what FAPE is. And again, it's individualized for each child. It's not based upon a diagnosis. It's very individualized. Um, and, oh, here's the statutory definition. Um, and it's reasonably designed to allow the student to make effective progress. Uh, and again, and it really, again, you look at the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. Um, I think I talked about these. These are the different placements. And, in terms of the IEP, you do get on the last, one of the last pages is this placement form. So it's really important that the district finds, identifies a placement that's appropriate for your child. Um, and then you as a parent are asked to respond both to the IEP and to the placement page. What, and you have 30 calendar, calendar days to do that. So again, when you respond to an IEP, you can either read it on all and say, this is like the greatest thing ever, I agree, I agree, I sign everything, great. You can say, eh, this is like 85% good. I will agree to all these things, but these two things I don't like, so I'm going to say, I don't want these, I like the rest, and that's called partial acceptance, and that's okay too. Or you can say, this is the worst thing I've ever read, I hate this, this has nothing to do with my child, and you can reject it. Those are all within your rights, you can do any of those. Um, so once that happens, then what the district does is we, we, they send it in to the state, and then the state sends you a document that talks about ways to resolve it. So you can ask for a team meeting, you can have a mediation, there's all sorts of things I'll talk about briefly. Um, and again, you also have a right, which is really important to know, like if your child's on an IEP for two years and then you decide, I don't want them to be on an IEP anymore, you can always say, I don't like this, I don't want it, I don't want my child to be on IEP, I re revoke services. And then your child will be considered a regular education student. Um, if that happens, we don't develop IEP meetings or anything like that. And, and you can always ask for your child to be evaluated again. In terms of independent evaluations, you have a right to your own private evaluation at your own expense at any time. Um, and now, because of the insurance laws within the past 10 years, a lot of insurance covers some, you know, a lot of those, which is great and different than it used to be. Um, and again, I talked about needing to meet within 10 days to review it. Um, then if, you, if the school does one, an evaluation, and you don't like it, you don't think it's sufficient, you think it's not good, and you disagree with it, 
then you have a right to, uh, to ask for this, to an evaluation paid for by the school district. Um, and that's called an independent evaluation. So under, under state law, there's a sliding scale that's based on income and the family furnishes financial information. And then um, the district pays the, the cost um, if it's the family income is less than or equal to 400% of the federal poverty level. Um, and there's a 16 month time limit. In the federal, um, if the federal law is different, so if the parents are not financially eligible or decline to give that information or request evaluation in an area not assessed by the school, then you follow the federal procedure. So then the district has to say, yeah, I agree, I'll pay, we'll pay for this evaluation, or we're gonna file a hearing request, which is um, with the Bureau of Special Education Appeals against you to say that our evaluation was comprehensive and appropriate. I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, those are just worked out with the district, yes. right? Those are not something the district likes to go to hearing on. It's not worth, you know, it's just not worth anyone's time to do that. Um, and again, to resolve disputes, it is best for everyone to try to resolve it formally, and you have to talk to people. And, and again, you can't, like, what you can't do, you can't call the superintendent and say, you know what, I think my child should be eligible, can you write an IEP for her? She doesn't, under the Educational Reform Act that I talked about at the beginning, she doesn't have the authority to do that. The federal law and state law are really clear that teens write IEPs. So when I say to resolve it informally, that means to contact the team and say, hey, you know what, could we please get together again and talk about this and see what we can do because these are things I don't like about my IEP. <coughs> um, that, if that doesn't work, going through a te another team meeting, or if it's a silly issue like we all agreed that there was going to be, um, I my child was going to have three hours of speech and there's, there's a typo and it only says two hours, yeah, you can call the special ed director and say, you know, there's a, there's a typo and can we fix it? And, and that's easy to do. Um, and also school committee does not have a role to, just so we all know, in like fixing IEPs or doing eligibility, it's just not within their purview. Um, so if, if informal ways don't work, then there's mediation, which is an opportunity. It's voluntary. Someone comes from the state and all they do are mediate special ed disputes all day, every day. They're funny, nice guy. Who is yours? For the, so is your mediator? Oh, we have um, Steve Lily Weber. Steve Lily Weber. So they're assigned and they switch sometimes. So you're always going to have Steve Lily Weber and he's a super nice guy and he comes in and he talks to everyone and he'll say, this is what the parent wants, this district, what do you say? And he tries to make everyone work it out. And that's mediation. It's free, it's easy, it's fast. Simple way to do it. If it's a bigger thing than you can go to the BSEA, which is the Bureau of Special Education Appeals, which is like a little court. So there's an administrative law judge, and you actually have like a trial. It's called a hearing, but it really essentially is a trial. And you basically present your evidence and say, this is why I think I should have this. The school presents their evidence and say, this is why I shouldn't have this. They shouldn't have this, or they should have this other thing. And an administrative law judge makes the decision. These, this process is very litigious. Um, you, it's very hard to do without an attorney. It's totally possible to do it. So there is a document on the website called the Pro Se Manual. Pro Se is a legal term means, meaning that a person is representing themselves. So there's a document called the BSEA Pro Se Manual that helps families who don't have an attorney work this, this figure out the system, but you know, anyone will tell you it's a litigious system that most often involves attorneys. So that is another option. Um, and any, during any dispute, you might hear something called stay put rights, which are essentially that if you, you always have the right, the district has an obligation to implement the last accepted IEP when there is a dispute until the dispute is resolved. Um, okay, those are resources. That right at eight o'clock. Very okay. Thank you so much, everyone, on this nice Wednesday night. Thank you. Thank you. Any quick questions? I know you have another speaker. Oh, that's another one. Oh. Thank you so much. Okay. Really thank, you. Your time. thank you. Thank you.